us with. The word is, in Greek, it is the logos. So here comes something Trinitarian slowly, which separates us from the Jewish people and from the Islamic people. That means for the Jewish people, the Islamic people, God is the Lord, but he is one. He is not differentiated in himself. And now here we have the word, and then we have God. It is, of course, God's word. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things came to be. We will later on see that the theology of, um, of the great mystic um, consists of three parts, of three ways. Three ways to walk on. The first way is the so-called via positiva, that means the positive way. And then the second path is the via negative, the negative way. And the third one is the breakthrough. Now this is all a little bit uh, unclear now, but what is in here now is the first way. And that is what we are used to in the church and so on. That means God creates, he creates through the logos, and that means everything in nature and in society, the family, the state, uh, history, art, all that carries the stamp of the Logos, a threefold stamp. And we will look at this a little bit later. So everything what is there around us is not only immediate, the birds, the houses, everything, but it is mediated. That the Jews and the Muslim and the Christians have in common. But why what it is mediated, namely the Logos, and that the Logos has its threefold, and that everything, the family and the state, everything is threefold. That is the via positiva, that is the positive way. We'll see later on what the negative is. So um, he was with God in the beginning, through him all things came to being. Not one thing had its being, but through him. And that means not only nature, but also man and his word, like the family and the state, the federal republic, and so on and so on. Everything is through the Logos. All that came to be had life in him, and that life was the light of man, a light that shines in the dark, a light that darkness could not overpower. So that means the idea is that the Logos through whom everything in nature, into the atoms, all what our quantum physicists study and so on. All that was created through the Logos. And this same Logos, and that is now specifically Christian, where the barriers are in discourse and so on. This Logos has become flesh. That is the hardest thing in Christianity <coughs> to take and to accept. And so uh, the next thing is a man came sent by God, his name was John. So John is not the cousin of Jesus, as people have taught sometimes or so. so. But it is the predecessor, was the teacher of Jesus. He taught him, Jesus was in his school, and then he even John baptized Jesus before he went into public life. A man came, sent by God, his name was John. He came as a witness, as a witness to speak for the light, so that everyone might believe through him. He was not the light, only a witness to speak for the light. That text is written about 100, and in the meantime, there was, in the beginning already, there was a certain competition between the followers of Jesus, who uh, John, who stayed with John. But Jesus left John and opened up another group. After he was baptized, he picked his friends, 12 and so on. So, and these two, they, uh, somehow, uh, somehow were in competition with each other. And so, therefore, it is emphasized here that John was a great man, and he prepared Jesus, but he was not Jesus. He was not the Logos who had become flesh. He only prepared him. The Word was the true light that enlightens all men. Here comes the idea of enlightenment. <coughs> the, um, uh, we talked already about the religious I try to make that clear to the journalist of, of the newspaper down there. So there is, on one side, we have the religious traditions and so on, and on the other hand, since 200 years, we have that secular enlightenment, and uh, it has been separated from religion. So there is the middle class enlightenment, the bourgeois enlightenment, for which our constitution comes. And then, since that did not take care of the fourth estate of the workers, 
therefore there was a socialistic enlightenment and then also a Freudian enlightenment. This word enlightenment was taken from here, but it was secularized. So this non-religious movement, you know, when we talk about homosexuals and we say uh, that is according to human rights or civil rights, uh, equal rights before the law and so on and so on, therefore they can get married, eight states have decided that now. That is the enlightenment, that's a secular thing. And it has turned into opposition of, uh, to, to the religious side. These are the culture wars. From the morning to the night, you have these culture wars about religious institutions paying for birth control or the divorce thing or whatever. All that are the culture wars. So that means the, the modern enlightenment comes from Christianity, but has turned against Christianity. And that is the struggle here between the people who don't believe in evolution and the people who believe in creationism and the others who don't believe in creationism, our schools and so on and so on. All of that has something to do with it. But it comes from Christianity. The word enlightenment comes over there. And enlightenment means for modern people, it means to free people from their fears and to make them into masters of their fate. Or it means for modern people to where it is, that means where our will to life is, our sexuality, our aggression, ego should be. Where it is, ego should be. So that is the enlightenment program, and that has become secular. <coughs> but it has its roots in Christianity. Liberalism, right? We have only two liberal parties. Liberalism comes from the Protestant paradigm, from the, uh, from the Presbyterians. And it was religious first, but then it has become secular. But then it's a little bit more secular in the Democratic Party, but it was also secular in the Republican Party until under Reagan, social conservatism was introduced. And then questions like uh, homosexuality and abortions on these questions came to the foreground. They were not there in the Republican Party. So originally both uh, forms of uh, liberalism, that means the neoliberalism, which is really older, which goes back behind our first Roosevelt. And then you have the Roosevelt liberalism on the other side. But both forms of liberalism, we have nothing else. We have no fascism. If we have fascism, it has to be sucked up by the Republican Party. If we have socialism, it has to be sucked up by the Democratic Party. Because we want to have balance. That is our balance, that is our genius including the emphasis on middle class. That means we want to strengthen between the working class and the high bourgeoisie, the Rockefeller, Rothschild, and so on. We want to have something in the middle which consists of farmers or shopkeepers and also since Flint here, the sit and strike, workers who are well paid because of the unions. So car workers and so on, they are called the middle class. So when they say we have to rescue the middle class, they really say we have to rescue the whole thing. Because if that antagonism between the high bourgeoisie and the 200 million workers on the other side, that would be explosive. That's what they have in South America, we always say. But we are different from those guys in South America. We are different because we have something in between. That's the middle class. That's why both parties always want to strengthen that middle class. But the question is what it means. So sometimes they say, this is the hard-working middle class. Then they mean blue and white collar workers uh, who work in the car industry or elsewhere and get a relatively high salary and therefore do not feel like workers anymore. And they don't want to be addressed, dear workers, but they want to be addressed middle class. And if a politician would call these workers not middle class, they would hate his guts. So he wouldn't even get to them, really. So they have to call them middle class. And because they think they are middle class, that's why they also vote like middle class, and they vote for the Republican Party. If they would overcome their false consciousness, the Republican Party would just fall down without any people anymore. The, the quantitatively, it could never make it into power again. They can make it into power only because millions of those who are really working class think they are middle class, but that takes us away too far. Okay, I, the point was about the secularization. Liberalism was originally a Protestant thing <laughs> and has been secularized. And also uh, things like spirituality 
the, the, I had a, a little attack recently in, in, on the campus because I said, what the hell is the content of spirituality? And some people don't want to call themselves religious, but they don't want to be without religion, so therefore they call themselves spirit, spiritual or spirituality. Spirituality is an old Protestant uh, notion, and it had a content once. But in the meantime, one doesn't know exactly what the determinations are. So what are you doing when you are spiritual? Except that they think, I don't like the old religions, I hate the old religions, but I don't want to be entirely without it. And that's called spirituality. But it has still no content whatsoever. Okay, so the word was the true light that enlightens all men. That is the religious meaning now still. And he was coming into the world, he was in the world, that had its being through him. And the world did not know him. Now here comes the rejection of the Jewish people against Jesus. So these texts have a context. And you can only understand these texts when you know the context. So in the context there are the followers of, uh, of uh, John the Baptist. <clears throat> and they thought the kingdom had come and therefore the law would be uh, cancelled. And Jesus makes clear against it, no, whoever changes one Jota from the law, he will be the least in the kingdom. See, this is anti-John. John had been executed, but his disciples were still around. And so very often you find in the text where there is an argument against somebody, but he is not really named. So the same way now, they, they, they came into his own, but the Jewish people, the Pharisees, did not accept him. The Sadducees did not accept him, and uh, so that is why he finally was murdered. Um, and this is your uh, fault, and so on. So there are elements of anti-Semitism. So you could say if you have a Jew who could uh, feel, like my friend Gregor Baum, who converted to Christianity, but he thinks there is anti-Semitism in the Gospels already. I am not so sure if that is really anti-Semitism. It is against not being accepted. So what that makes clear, so Jesus came, he offered them the kingdom and so on, but people did not accept him, they misunderstood him, they didn't understand him at all, and then they murdered him. That is where Karl Marx then later on, when he talks to his uh, uh, little daughter, and to the daughter asks, why did we go to church? He said, about the music, or well, the Catholic church, they went to London. Beautiful music, and then he says, well, there was once a poor man, and the rich people murdered him. That is here in John 2, where Jesus says, and you think you are the children of Abraham, but you are not because you want to kill me. You want to murder me, and therefore you are not the children of Abraham. You think you are the children of God, but you want to kill me. Therefore, you are not the children of God. You are the children of Satan, and so on. So this is the, uh, Jesus, the more he challenges the rich and the powerful, the more they react. So particularly the Sadducee priesthood. The Sadducees all went under uh, in the year 70 and uh, 134, the second attack, and uh, only the Pharisees remained. Every rabbi here where we go next week, I take my class, they're all Pharisees. The Sadducees went under together with the priesthood and so on. No sacrifice anymore, temple gone and so on. <laughs> so that is the background. He came to his own domain because it is his own, because everything was created in him, and his, uh, and his own people did not accept him. His own people, he was a Jew. Now the fascists with whom I grew up, they wanted to prove that Jesus was not a Jew. They thought that Jesus was an anti-Semite, and a good one. And so that he really was, but then they had to prove that he was, uh, that he was a Germanic tribesman, that he was an Aryan. The Aryans were called at that time the Edomites. So there's a long struggle between the Semites and the Edomites. And so the Nazi interpretation, the fascist interpretation is that Jesus was an Aryan, but how did he become an Aryan? Well, Galilee was occupied by the Roman troops, and the Roman troops uh, consisted mainly of Gallians, that means the French today. So Gallia, and they were, they were uh, Aryans, and so Mary had a relationship to, uh, to one of those Aryans, and so Jesus has be became half Aryan. And the Nazis got that out of the Talmud, because the Talmud thought that Mary was a prostitute, and that's how she became pregnant. And so the Nazis, ironically enough, took that from the Talmud. Eichmann spoke 
in Hebrew and he spoke Yiddish and uh, these SS men, they were anti-Semitic specialists and they knew Yiddish and they had learned it from the rabbis and so on, so they knew the whole background. So, but that made Jesus only half Aryan. Well, Hitler forgave people who were <coughs> half Aryan. He had 150,000 half Aryans in his army, high and high officials as status, generals and so on. And um, the, in the, it would have been, would be decided at the end of the war um, what they did during the war. If they were very heroic, they would be complete honorary Aryans, but it was not yet decided, and so on. it was never decided. And many of them were killed already before the war ended. But to all who did accept him, he gave the power to become children of God. That is important now for the, for the mystics, to become sons of God. There's not only one son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, we all can become sons of God. That is the third way, the breakthrough. The breakthrough means that one comes to the point through the positive way and through the negative way. One comes to a point where one can grasp this, that we all can become the sons of God, the daughters of God, or the children of God, and so on. If we uh, deal ad adequately with that having and, and being, so the more we move from having to being, the more we are open to become then the children of God. So that was the, um, uh, that is the children of God issue. To all who believe in the name of him who was born, not our, of human stock, is the virgin birth now, which was there in Judaism and which is in Islam as well. If you attack a student here and you deny the virgin birth of Mary, a Muslim, he will be more furious than any Catholic. So, um, who was born not out of human stock, or an urge of the flesh, or, or will of man, but God of God himself. Now here comes the important word. The word was made flesh. That is called the incarnation. That is the bewitched type of a word which keeps the three Abrahamic religions apart. So wherever you have um, discourse with uh, Islamic brothers and sisters, or Jewish brothers and sisters, that will be the point of uh, argumentation where it gets difficult. And therefore, it is better always to start with a Christology from below. So when, uh, when, when Marx talks to his children, he talks about the carpenter in his life, and so on. that's a Christology from below. When he says, and the rich, there was a poor man, and the rich people murdered him, and so on, that is Christology from below. This is Christology from above because it is, comes from God, the Word becomes flesh, and so on and so on. The other Christology comes from below. There's Jesus, and he is a carpenter, and he challenges the ruling class, and the rich, and the son, they kill him, and so on. So, and usually in any kind of discussions with other Abrahamic faith communities, it is better to uh, start with this Christology from below, because there are many things Jesus stands there, and he weeps about the temple, and he weeps about his friend Lazarus. He is a very human, human being, and he's hungry, and he gets angry, and he says, Peter says, you are from God, and so says, Peter, you are blessed, that doesn't come from you, that comes from God. Five minutes later, Jesus says, I have to go to Nazareth, to Jerusalem, and the bastards will kill me, and so on, and uh, Peter says, no, no, that should not be. And then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. He had just lifted him up, and there he gets behind him, Satan. So mood swings, we call that today. So he uh, had a real mood swing there. So um, he lived, and, and so there are many of these uh, things with which uh, Jews have no problems. And, but there are some statements in the New Testament, <coughs> like, for instance, um, before Abraham was, I was, or the Father and I are one, or who sees me sees the Father, or nobody comes to the Father except through me, or nobody knows, knows the Father then except me, and so on and so on. These are then sentences which the mystics at, at Eckhart take very seriously. So, uh, but for a long time you can talk in very human terms, like you talk about Socrates. And Socrates was a great teacher in Athens and was killed by the state, Jesus was a great teacher in Jerusalem, was killed by the state. They have great similarities. But you are not a believer yet. So you can say nice things about Jesus without being a believer. One becomes a believer only through this text here. 
the confession that in Jesus the Son, the, the Son of the Father has become man, he had become flesh. The incarnation makes a Christian a Christian. Otherwise you can talk very humanistically and, and so on about it. And, but there's nothing wrong in, in any discourse to start with that where there is consensus before one gets to the issues where, the, where we have to agree to disagree for the time being. So the Word was made flesh, he lived among us, and we saw his glory. So John is one of the, one of the disciples, so he has personal experience of Jesus. <laughs> the glory that is his as the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth, and John appears and so on and so on. So this is incarnation thing, and that is the important issue for, that is where Master Eckhart wants to take us to, in order to understand what that means psychologically and pneumatologically. He has a, a teaching of the spirit, what that is, a word which we have completely lost in our culture. We still talk about it sometimes, the spirit of a football team or the spirit of a nation or whatever, but nobody knows what that is. The psychologist, for the psychologist, is only a black box. Um, there is no spirit. So attempts which have been made to resurrect that word is, uh, have failed so far. So um, therefore, we don't know exactly. And uh, during uh, political, you know, campaigns or so, the word can be used, and then it's just an expression of enthusiasm and feeling good. It, it has, uh, it has in itself the connotation of unity to form an almost more perfect union, as we say, the Declaration of Independence. So it has something about this unity, and it has the element also of conquering disunion uh, of class, the dualisms of the genders, the generations, and so on. So uh, the spirit of the nation means we are, at this moment at least, we are really one, and we are standing together, and we hold together depression, or something like this. So there is some shadow of what was once meant with, uh, with spirit, but it is not a word which you can use today in, in psychoanalysis or in sociology or in anthropology or whatever. Okay, so that was our reading, and then a uh, short uh, one to jump to the other one which is very important, and that is this having and not having and being, and we discussed that the last time a little bit. But we have to go to the Sermon on the Mount here, where Jesus, and we go to Matthew there, Sermon on the Mount is from 5 to 7, <coughs> and there we have the Beatitudes, seeing the crowds, he went up the hill. We don't know if he goes up the hill, because Matthew goes up the hill, but Luke goes on evil, equal territory. So it is uh, um, the north of the Sea of Galilee. There is a hill and there's a little chapel, and people say this is where the Sermon on the Mount was preached. But for Luke, there is no hill whatsoever, it's flat territory. And then it is probably not one sermon, but it is the writers, the, the different uh, authors, have put it together. So these are probably many sermons which Jesus gave in Galilee and Judea and so on, and they summed it all up and pushed it together. But <coughs> the Beatitudes, then uh, he began to speak. This is what he taught them. How happy are the poor in spirit. So this is the issue. That is the second way, the via negativa, the negative way to become poor, and or then also to be without knowledge. But it presupposes, of course, something positive first. So when Eckhart speaks about the um, Docta Ignorantia, and Cardinal Foucault later on too, who could have made a reformation without disintegration of Christianity. Um, so Nicholas, of course, they talked about this Docta Ignorantia, that means uh, uh, um, a learned ignorance, a learned ignorance. That means after we went to go to the Via Positiva and we see God's word and in all things around us, made by men or not in nature and so physics and chemistry and so on, then we have to get rid of all of this. But this Dr. Ignorantia, this learned ignorance presupposes knowledge, of course. It does not mean stupid. It doesn't mean you have to become stupid or so. That means particularly the more you know, the more you can then shift from the first way to the second way and let go. That's our theme, to let all these things go in order to become empty, in order then to approach the Godhead, 
Not only the Trinity, even the Trinity has to go. All images have to go, the second and the third commandment. Um, and only then you have to move beyond the uh, self differentiation of God into the Word and in the Spirit. There where God was not yet differentiated, and where you yourself were not yet differentiated from God, but you were still one with God. And the eye through which he saw you, you see him, and there is this oneness with God. That is what the mystic is all about. That is number three then, the breakthrough. But this breakthrough presupposes the positive way, the negative way, and then comes the breakthrough. We'll discuss that a little bit more. So, but nevertheless, there are the, uh, the Sermon of the Mount there, the, we know all this, how happy are the poor in spirit. It says here in spirit still, Luke le leaves that out, the spirit, later on. So it may be the normal poverty, which we have 40 million people or whatever are in poverty here. So it can mean the physical poverty, your needs are not fulfilled. You don't have enough to eat, to clothing and housing and heat in the house and so on. That's one poverty. But then there is the other poverty of, uh, in terms of the spirit. And uh, Eckhart uh, means, of course, first the real one, uh, and, but then he talks about this other one, that, you, that we have to empty ourselves of all the knowledge, of all the concept, of all the images which we have. We have to empty our will as well of all the inclinations and passions and so on and so on. Um, which must not be misunderstood in a dualistic way, as if there was a, a hostility between the spirit and the body or whatever, and asceticism. That's Asian. That is not what Eckhart has in mind. We have to, so we don't want to fall into any type of a misunderstanding. So that is the, about the poor there, and then it goes on. Um, happy the gentle, they have the earth for their heritage. Happy those, and of course the poor, Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So poverty is the precondition uh, of, um, uh, of entering the kingdom of God. And Thomas More, whom name we have here, he wrote the Utopia. And according to the Utopia, socialism, communism, is the precondition for the kingdom. So he has this young man, a young rich man, and he comes to him and says, what do I have to do in order to get eternal life? And Jesus says, you have to follow the commandment. These are the commandments. You should not murder. You should not steal. You should not commit adultery, and so on. And uh, so then the young fellow says, I have done all this. Now, how he could become rich without stealing is a great, uh, is a great problem. But Jesus was not an economist, so nevertheless. So he said, I have done all this. I have not killed anybody. I have not stolen his wife, and so on. So. And then Jesus says that you have to do one thing more. Take all your property and sell it, and then come back and follow me. So this is the issue then which, uh, you know, which Master Eckhart has in mind. <coughs> but there are others, and I just want to go through them here. So happy, the gentle, they who do not kill and violent and so on, they shall have the earth for their heritage. Happy those who mourn, they shall be com comforted. These are the most beautiful words which have ever been said in world literature, by the way. Happy those who hunger and thirst for what is right, they shall be satisfied. Happy the merciful, they shall have mercy shown them. Happy the pure in heart, that's another thing with this poverty. Pure in heart does not have anything to do with sex. It has something to do with freeing oneself from this earthly wisdom which can be get in the way, the creation can get in the way, and the more knowledge I have, the more I may be estranged from the real truth of all these things. I may be so fascinated by a relative historical truths, physical truths, and so on, that I am blocked so that I cannot see the truth. So purity of heart means to free myself from all blockages of fascinating and good things in nature and in history, uh, good wisdom and so on. So it's not said anything bad about this. Uh, purity of heart means not you have to get rid of yourself of bad things, but, but it means you have to get rid of yourself of nature as well as of history in order to be open. The emptier you are, the more God can penetrate. Like nature and history, God cannot tolerate empty spaces. So when you are empty, then then he must come. You're in a certain sense a little bit magic. You, even force him. He cannot resist 
it has to come to you. And so so um, they shall be called the, the happy the peacemakers. Uh, we don't go around with drones there all the time. They shall be called the sons of God. Happy those who are persecuted in the cause of right. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven and so on. So let me just go to Luke for a moment where you have a shorter version and a little bit different. You know that all these Gospels come from different communities in the Roman Empire from different times, from the 60s, 70s on to about 100 when John wrote. He is the last one who writes one. So uh, here I have Luke, it's Luke 6 there, and you have it on your little paper there too. Um, the, uh, where are we? 5, 6. So Luke is a little bit more radical somehow. He was supposed to have been a medical doctor and maybe also not a Jew, but I don't know how sure we are of all these things. Okay, uh, now that's Mark. Now, Mark is the first one. And then there is a source Q, which is before Mark. And they all stole from him, from this source Q. Plagiarism all over the place. Okay, so uh, six. Here yeah, I have it. I have it in a minute. Just a little bit. Patient. Here it is. Mm, six. six yeah, okay. Here. So it's called the inaugural discourse, uh, the Beatitudes again. But then fixing his eyes on his disciples, fixing his eyes on his disciples. So he stared a little bit at them in order to make clear to them how important that is. How happy are you who are poor? Not in the spirit, but all over. Uh, yours is the kingdom of God. Happy you who are hungry now, not for justice, really hungry in the stomach. Happy you who are hungry now, you shall be satisfied. Happy you who weep now, you shall laugh. Happy are you when people hate you, drive you out, abuse you, denounce your name is as criminal on account of the Son of Man. That is what Jesus calls himself. That's the only title he gives to himself, the Son of Man. He never called himself the Son of God or the Messiah or anything like this. So rejoice at what the other name titles were all given to him by his friends. So the friends were so overwhelmed by his presence that they looked into their tradition and they gave him those titles in order to express what they had experienced. Rejoice when that day comes and dance for joy, then your reward will be great in heaven. I just saw yesterday, saw about the Greek and he has these beautiful dances there, the Greek, old Greek dances, so to dance full of joy, and so on, is meant really, yeah, not, not only symbolically or whatever. <laughs> and to rejoice when that day comes and dance for joy, then your reward will be great in heaven. This was the way their ancestors treated the prophets. <laughs> there you see why, why Nazis can say, you know, that there was an anti-Semitic element as if Jesus was attacking Judah, but I think that's a misunderstanding. Okay, now come the curses, the curses, which are missing in the other one. Uh, but also for you who are rich, you are having your consolation now. Don't wait for any consolation. Alas, for you who have your fill now, you shall go hungry. Alas, for you who laugh now, you shall mourn and weep. <coughs> Alas for you, when the world speaks well of you, this was the way their ancestors treated the false prophets. So what is important for us now is this <coughs> thing, first of all, that we should know the well, the world, embrace the world. The second way is how we can free ourselves and have this purity of the heart or this poverty and then the opening up, and then the breakthrough in which the transformation takes place. Okay, so this is our reading today, and the next time we want to see what the early Christian community, if they took that seriously or not, and we'll see they did. Okay, so that was our first part. Now I want to repeat shortly what we tried to do the last time, and you have it in writing, so if things are a little bit complicated, then you have it always down there, and you can carry it home. So in our first discourse, we introduced ourselves to Master Eckhart, 
Uh, he died in 1328. Uh, sometimes it's 1327. Uh, sometimes people know the birth date, but the birth date does not seem to be very sure, so I left it out. We want to be sure that what we say has some basis. He was a Dominican, we said, a member of a beggar order. So that is very important. Beggar order is dress the vow of poverty. No um, poverty, and we know that there were two orders, the Franciscans and the Dominicans, and both of them, and this is a strange phenomenon, whenever you have a movement coming up outside of the church, that means outside of the Roman Catholic Church, outside of the Orthodox Church, but the Roman Catholic Church now, then the church develops inside a counterpart, a legitimate part of the illegitimate part outside. So the outside people were the Albigenses and the Waldenses, who were also a revolutionary movement. Christianity is from the very beginning very rebellious. You can hardly notice it if you could look at Kalamazoo, but it was, it was once and it is very rebellious. And uh, sometimes this rebelliousness breaks through. So these Albigenses and Waldenses were poor, pe poor people who rebelled against their masters. So it was a form of class struggle. And we have class struggle since we have private property. And we have private property since about 10,000 years ago. At that time, we changed from, from, from fishermen and fruit gatherers and hunters to farmers. And when we went farmers, we had to work the land, and we worked our land. And then the property grew in the villages, and it grew in the city-states, like Babylon and Nineveh and Sodom and Gomorrah and the five cities and so on. And in these cities developed something between the family and the state. And that means it moved out of the state. So they made their shoes in the family. Then they went out and produced more shoes than they needed in the family. And then you had shoe factories, and the same thing with bread factories, and so on. And then you have a market, and then you have exchange. And we, uh, Jesus lived on a very low level of exchange society. We have the extreme of an exchange society. You can, ident you can uh, define the American society as a commodity exchange society and absolutely nothing else. Everything, even my teaching in the university, is a commodity which uh, either is sold and bought or not, and then I'm unemployed and so on. So everything, even church, everything is commodified, is wayified, thingified, which has something to do with our mental illnesses and which has something to do with Fromm's program from having to being instead. So get rid of this commodification, this reification of consciousness which shapes our senses, our eyes, our ears, and so on. There's a nice love story there in the middle of the love story. It cuts and there's advertisement, toothpaste, or some miserable car or whatever with a blondie in it and so on. Well, it goes in and they go on kissing again. If that makes not somebody neurotic, I mean, that is why they're all on Prozac in my class. It's just impossible what this is doing, not only to the outside nature, but there's an inside nature in us as well, which is as ruined as the outside is. When you talk about global warming, there is much more global warming going on inside than outside. So that, uh, for us, it's strange because we think capitalism is such a beautiful thing. I don't know who still thinks it, but there are still people. And for a few years ago, we didn't even mention capitalism. It just came up with a great uh, 2008 uh, collapse and so on. So, and we'll talk more about it in the future, I'm quite sure. <laughs> so, nevertheless, the, it is a class struggle thing. <clears throat> and in this class struggle thing, these Christians, these Albigenses and Valdenses, they took the side of the poor against the masters who did these injustices, who um, stole their land and their fishing crowns and so on. So it was, it followed, they followed the Sermon on the Mount, but they had also very earthly things. There was a Lex Prime Noctis, the white of the first night. That means every feudal lord could die and could sleep with the wife of every farmer in the wedding night. Do you know how long that right existed? Up to 1918 in the suburbs of Vienna, where a young priest was fired because he denied the feudal lord the right to sleep with his farmer's wives and so on. So this humiliation, this lack of recognition, 
it's not only when you are serf or wage laborer or whatever that you have not enough money or so. It is also the humiliation. Why don't people want to be workers and want to be middle class? Because it sounds better, right? So there are different dimensions to this whole class thing. Nevertheless, religious people were in the forefront. But these people, these Waldenses and so on, they became heretical. They taught some things which were not in the Bible, and the church excommunicated them. But the church did not only excommunicate them and said, you were not on the right track or so, but suddenly inside of the church developed the same thing, but now legitimately. Uh, St. Francis did not want to be ordained because the class system is inside of the church. There are this, the clergy, these are the subjects, and that's the laity, which means the stupid ones. That is the translation of it. And they are taught all the time, these lay people, and they, are, uh, they get the sacraments administered to them. And so uh, the, the, somehow what you have outside the class system is also inside as well. And so therefore, uh, St. Francis did not want to be ordained but uh, they forced him to take the tonsure. This has been uh, cancelled in the meantime. There were four ordinations before the subdeaconate, and before that you got a little landing place for the Holy Spirit there. They cut out some hair there, uh, and that was, you were then elevated into the state of the clergy by this, without getting anything else. So that's all he got. He couldn't tolerate any more, because there was too much inequality already. So, and we mentioned that he wanted to, his monks, he came home once from uh, Spain and his friends in Assisi had moved into a new house. And what did he do? He gave them order. All of them had to leave the new house. And they said, but we have some sick brothers, sick brothers out too. All of them had to leave the new house. So much was the intensity, this early intensity, outside of the church and inside of the church, against poverty, against alienation, against reification, against commodification. And there it was only the beginning. That means St. Francis in comparison to even some, let's say Abjan, it was a childlike situation. I mean, that was on a much lower level of accumulation of wealth, accumula exchange of commodities and, and so on than it is now. I mean, Kalamazoo is on a much higher level than Assisi was, and Assisi was on a higher level than Jerusalem was. So it is a continual increase of this having, 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 and that loss of being. And so we said already, the more having, the more insanity. The more being, the more sainthood. The way to sainthood goes through being, the way to insanity and Prozac and so on, that goes through having, having, having all the time. I to just visit my classes, I can show it to you every morning. <laughs> I said, have you all been on Prozac this morning? Do you feel good now? So, you know, I have some lawyer children. Some of my children are lawyers. They say, you cannot say this, you cannot say this. I said, I want to know if they feel good. It's very important to feel good before we start. Okay. So, so the Franciscans and the Dominicans are the legitimate protest against the feudal laws and so on. But the Pope himself was a feudal lord. And Innocence III was the biggest of all of them, the most powerful pope ever. Uh, he, he owned all of South America and whatever later on, the, the, the popes from him, not at that time, but later on. So, uh, and, and the pope, not only did he force him to get this tonsure there on his head, but he also forced him that the order had to be, um, had to be, had to have poverty. And the same with Clara, who was his girlfriend, he was, had a beautiful, oh, most saints have a good, nice girlfriend. And she was Clara, she developed her own order, the Clarissen, who um, gave me food when I was a student. I was even poorer than they were. So I went there and I ate there every year. They were very strict in the Münster, in the city of Münster. I studied in the city of Münster. <laughs> and there I went every 12 o'clock, I went there and they gave me a nice uh, food there. And uh, I could, uh, the, the abbot or the, the female form of an abbot, I could speak uh, with her only through an uh, iron, uh, Quid uh, and the curtain. I only heard her voice behind that, and then they had one guest sister who came out and she gave me the soup. And but otherwise I, won. but there was always a lot of happiness inside and laughter. But there were old nuns there who had never seen a car, 
That was in 1950, and they had never seen a car. So they were really cloistered. So that, these were the Franciscan sisters, and very radical in their, in their attitudes. <coughs> okay, so the uh, outside, the, the, the opposed, the mode of being against the mode of having of that time. So we are not in a state. Um, again, there were the state youth, Hitler youth, and whatever, and they were trained again and militarized, and again they killed each other in the Normandy and in Poland and whatever. So, um, and then in the 60s, yeah, there was again, they broke out in Chicago and in Boston and in Tokyo and in Frankfurt and in Rome and so on. Everywhere they rose again against the iron cage, uh, which was in the war, in the Vietnam War, on top of it, cannot talk about war without talking about capitalism. There was uh, Chicago 7 and the uh, judge in the 7. It was a hilarious type of a theater. <laughs> so um, the, uh, again, they wanted to have new love. <laughs> and I was involved here with the university in, in Detroit and this youth movement. And I had them, as the Gestapo, not the Gestapo, the FBI, always in front of my house. Uh, they were sitting there, they came into the house, they were all Catholics, they all had their revolver there in their jacket, good Catholics, and they looked for students, and uh, the students had long run through the back door, and there were forests, and, they, and then the FBI was behind them, one, and they were all a little bit round, and the others, the students were thin, so they, they run and run, and so then they came back, they were out of breath, and I said, what the hell are you doing? These are youngsters, these are children, why are you running after the children? The whole town is full of the mafia. The, 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 there's a connection between Detroit and Chicago, and they are all settling here in, in town. So concentrate on the mafia. <laughs> it was probably too simple. They, they want to have a simpler job. They run after the students. So, and it was, they, they can become dangerous. The police becomes very nasty uh, when you have destabilization. So uh, they, if, I, if they could have found, caught one of these students, and they would have found that I gave him a shirt, that would be $500 and five years imprisonment. That was the punishment. And the, um, the judges down there were very nice. They said the FBI have to come to us first and have to be ask for permission, and uh, then they can do something, but then we will we'll deal with it, and so on. And at that time, the, the police was still more under control than now because of the Patriot Act on September 11th. They can do much more today than they could do at that time. So. Um, but they, they terrorized my wife and my ch seven children and so on, so it was very uncomfortable and they wrote everything down. When I gave speeches in the Senate here in, on campus or the Democratic Party, they wrote everything down. Only when the Cardinal invited me in Baltimore and I spoke against the Vietnam War, then they couldn't fly after, uh, behind me. So then I don't have the reports about my speeches in Baltimore, but all about here in Lansing and so on. So, and then there was the Freedom of Information Act, and I went to Papua and picked up my thing there. And so it uh, was very interesting. Now I have all the texts of my speeches, because the police wrote it down. They didn't understand a word, but what I said, that was very good. So they could never make a case somehow and go to the judge. It was too complicated somehow, but they always had the number of my car, and they wrote everything. Uh, nicely down, and then the informers were all crossed out. In France, you get the informers. Here the informers are protected. But the informers were my own students because I told them to write down what I said in class and go to the FBI, and they would be paid for it. <laughs> and they were paid for it. It was a source of income. I was a, a, a job creator. I, I created a job. It was very good. So, so they had all kinds of they got the money, and I know now what I said, <laughs> because otherwise I, I don't write it down. So, okay, so that was about <laughs> the, um, we also, we mentioned uh, um, Johannes Baptist Metz, and then also Karl Schmidt. Karl Schmidt was Hitler's theologian, political theologian. So there is, in the church a right, right, and there is a left that's very serious, you know. So Karl Schmidt represented the political theology from, uh, um, from Augustine to Thomas Aquinas through the Jesuits in Spain, fascist Spain. And then you have uh, uh, and, and the right-wing theology uh, expresses the interests of the ruling class, the slaveholders, the feudal lords, and the capitalists. 
the others represent the, the interests of the poor and the workers and so on. So there is this struggle inside of the church. And Ratzinger was against these liberation theologians. He spoke for this type of a right-wing uh, theology. And they are both smart. You know, Carl Schmitt was a genius in law. He was a uh, Hitler's Jewist and his political theologian. So um, he was in Nuremberg, but he never uh, committed any crimes. So he, I mean, physically, uh, he traveled for Nazism and spread the news, and, but he didn't kill anybody. So uh, Nuremberg let him go. He was denazified in Germany, and he didn't want to be denazified. See, these Nazis want to remain, the fascists want to remain. You know, Sigi Jung was one who, a fascist who converted, a psychologist, you know. But the others, Karl Schmidt, died as a fascist. The great philosopher Heidegger, whom they talk about in Nazi there, the, 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 he died as a fascist. Eliade, who is the co-founder of our department here, religion department, he died as a fascist. So, uh, the, uh, and, but we don't want to go into this, but uh, this Karl Schmidt there, the, the Metz, is the founder of this new political theology against the old one. And that doesn't mean that they hate each other or whatever. As a matter of fact, old Schmidt came to the parish of Metz in Bavaria, and Metz celebrated the mass there, which is very funny because the very baroque, you know, conservative little church he has there, and then he has these revolutionary ideas, so that he sometimes he had a neurosis, he produced accidents for himself. And everybody said, see, Baptist, you cannot have those two things. You cannot have this conservative church and then have these revolutionary thoughts. You will punish yourself. And then he had a new accident. And so, so it was very funny. Not, not funny, it was a sad story. So, but nevertheless, Schmidt came to his church and uh, he said, you are, um, said to the young, he was a young priest and Schmidt was an old man in the meantime. He said, you are this Prometheus uh, theologian, you know, and I am the Epimetus theologian. The Epimetus is the, um, the god who looks backward in the, in the past. The other Prometheus is the one who looks forward into the future and so on. So they had to talk with each other. Okay, so um, that, and we have then our movie, and the movie should help us, you know, in a little funny way. Uh, to represent what is most difficult to see, namely where we are, what our society is like. It is easier to see uh, what the 20s were like, but it's very hard to see what 2013 is like. They, we have a blind spot, everybody has a blind spot, where one cannot see that what is immediate, which makes um, ethical decisions unbelievably difficult. And I, one example which I thought, uh, tell usually and didn't hear, but and which I have told a thousand times, also written down. Uh, I uh, I came to school one morning and uh, to Lessing High School, and uh, there was an old lady going in front of me, and there was a black suit on. And it was April, I don't know, 1940s early, and uh, so my bike had broken down, and I um, thought maybe she had this big uh, luggage to carry, and she was maybe 70 or whatever. And I thought, well, maybe I put the luggage on my bike and then we roll down together. And then I come around her and then she had this huge yellow star of David, which the Nuremberg laws enforced on her. And I was not even allowed to talk to her, but the Catholic youth movement was not anti-Semitic. And so I talked to her and she was very shy. And so I put that, you know, in, in, on my her luggage and I drove her down to the air shelter where the Jews were collected to be transported into the concentration camps. And we should have known, you know, they had told her at night she would go there to the east and she would have a nice ending of her life outside the city and the nice country things and it all sounded so good. And we should have known, you know, that she is 75 years old and cannot even carry a suitcase anymore. And what should she do in a working camp? We all knew that the concentration camps were working camps. We didn't know yet that they were uh, death camps. They became death camps only from Pearl Harbor on. So, <coughs> but uh, what I want to say is, to, I, I could say I'm a good Catholic little boy, and I helped this woman that was a good deed of my day. But what did I really do? I helped her to go in the concentration camp. See, that means why why we have such a hard time to commit a mortal sin is that we don't know the hell what we are doing. 
that can be helpful sometimes on Judgment Day. No, uh, the, the, we, we did that on, on the, uh, the, there was a building, IG Farm, where they did the, uh, where they did Cyclone B, the insecticide, by which then the killing took place, and that was right on our way. We met right under that building. But we didn't know what that building did. We didn't know about Fritz Haber, the Jew who invented the gas war, and also the insecticides later on. And nothing about that. We knew nothing. I just knew that there was a woman with a luggage. See, that is how stupid we are when we have to make ethical decisions. Therefore, we must be very forgiving when we say, well, you didn't make the right choice or whatever. How in God's name should people make a right, right, right choice with that low level of consciousness which we usually have? So, okay, that's just on the side. So, that's what we do. And now we want to go very shortly, we want to do the two next thing. We want to start out always with a time diagnosis. Time diagnosis means you take an event and then um, you analyze the event and make a prognosis out of it. And today, of course, we want to take that uh, uh, one time diagnosis uh, also in terms of our having and being. And that is, of course, the event which struck us today. Dustin called me early in the morning there, uh, what had happened in Rome that the Pope had decided to resign. So, and uh, the day the Kalamazoo Gazette came in the afternoon, and I told him about it and thought a little bit about it with him and so on. So, uh, let's take that as the only one today uh, because it is, it is an important thing. So. It hasn't happened, uh, you know, for so long. <laughs> it has happened in the 15th century. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the Pope, several popes, several popes resigned in the 15th century. Sometimes there were three popes uh, at the same time, and they all resigned, but they were all forced to resign. Uh, they were not, uh, they were not, didn't voluntarily. That means the council was very powerful. It was more powerful than the popes. And so it was particularly the council of, uh, of, um, um, the council of Constance. Council of Constance, the same council which promised Hus, the predecessor of uh, Luther in Bohemia, to come to Constance and to defend himself and he would have secure uh, travels, and uh, the council uh, lied. The council burnt him, and uh, the uh, uh, the one <coughs> on which he was burnt, you can still visit, people visit it in Basel, and uh, you can see where this horrible crime uh, was committed. So this very powerful council also invited um, the three popes, and they deposed two of them right away, So. They resigned, but they were forced to resign. And one, John the Twenty-Third, came a little bit later to Constance, and at night with his horse, and um, the, uh, he heard he thought he would be accepted by the council, and then he found out the rumor that he was to be deposed too next day, and so he went back on his horse, and he was riding up to uh, to the Black Forest in order to flee and uh, to remain pope. Uh, and the council came together the next day. And uh, they uh, um, sent the police after him. He was caught and was brought back to the council, and the council sentenced him to five years hard labor in Venice. So he was sent to Venice, and Roncalli, that is John the Twenty-Third, took his name later on for 500 years, 600 years. Uh, no pope called himself John the Twenty-Third, in spite of the fact of the John Gospel and the John letters and the John disciple. Uh, friend of Jesus, and so on. And so they were so ashamed of what, uh, of this uh, Pope, first John the Twenty-Third, that they didn't take his name anymore. But Roncalli took his name and uh, then also did some other unusual things. He saw the birth control difficulties of many uh, working class Catholics. The, uh, the holding class, the corporate holding class, had spent $10 million to develop the pill and had put the whole working class on the pill and could achieve zero population, which we have now, 2.1% babies, and all the Catholics and all the Jews and all the Muslims all have 2.1%. That means they all ignore their religion and they do what the capitalistic system 
dictates to them. And it regulates the employment and the normal situation. That means the employment will not go too high, in which case there's unemployment and restlessness. And it will also not to go too low, in which the price of labor goes up too high and eats into the profit. So, and then also the military, that they have enough soldiers to fight for their interests uh, around the world, for, be it for, uh, for the rubber in Vietnam or for coffee in El Salvador or for oil in Iraq or whatever. <laughs> so um, that was a godsend, but it produced um, very different now with the teaching of the church, and John uh, called a commission, a uh, Kalamazoo kind of doctor was in it, um, in order to see if Catholics could use the pill. And <laughs> the commission decided two to one that they could, uh, with the uh, uh, consultation with their husbands and the doctors and priests, and, and particularly their own conscience. And, uh, <clears throat> and then came the crisis. John died, and he also called the council. See, the other one ran away from the council. And Ron Kali called in a council. So popes act in a very, uh, first of all, with a long memory, and then also it, uh, this, this resignation is not just happening this morning. Uh, they are thinking for this for a long, long time. And when they make their decisions, they make their decision in the perspective of centuries. And so um, Ron Kali called, the, uh, the one run away from the Constance Council, and he called in the Second Vatican Council in order um, also to because the church had fallen because of its hate of communism uh, which it shares with the liberals and with the fascists allied itself with the liberals first and then with the fascists and then now with the liberals again um, and uh, so the church had acted against itself it had betrayed itself and uh, had not done enough for the Jews and, and he wanted to make all that good so John the 23rd I, I was at John the Twenty Third uh, Chair uh, in uh, Frederick in Canada for for a year, and I felt very honored that I, under his name, I really like to teach and to, to have that name. So, um, nevertheless, that was a decisive thing. But then uh, the council took place. Uh, it opened up the doors and the windows, and it let the modern air come in. And when you repress problems for a long time and they accumulate, and you have to solve them all in a very short time, it's catastrophic. So um, the, uh, the thousands of priests left, and nuns, uh, and uh, with or without laicization, and Paul VI, a very noble man, a sensitive man, got frightened. He got neurotic and did not even allow the seminarians to go to the movie anymore at night, and didn't give them any keys anymore, and strange things happened. So, but then he wrote this fateful encyclical Humane Vitae um, uh, about human life in which he uh, reinformed, reaffirmed the, uh, <coughs> the ban on the, the uh, negative artificial birth control, uh, as it had been taught by the church for centuries. And in the meantime, many Catholic women had gone on the pill already, and they expected that the church would have insight and uh, it didn't, it didn't happen. The church in the last, uh, and these are catastrophic times for the church, and that has something to do with the resignation today. Um, the uh, church tried to undig something which Thomas Aquinas had taught, namely the erroneous conscience doctrine. That means on Judgment Day, we will not be judged according to the teaching of the church, but according to our own conscience. And so they tried to get that out of the box, but it came too late. Um, <coughs> Catholics also didn't like the thing of erroneous. They said, either I follow my conscience, and then my conscience is right and not erroneous. What the church meant was the conscience was erroneous by the church's teaching, but it was right in itself, but that was too complicated. So people just didn't go to confession anymore, and still don't do today. I mean, some do still, but because people said it doesn't make any sense to confess one month and then you do it again next month and, and we cannot have more than three children. If you have more than 2.1 two one children in this country, your house will be too small, your car will be too small, and the starting chances of your children will be too low. And so you will do that only one generation and then you get your wisdom and you will not do it again. 
So you will have still the grand grandparents that maybe had five children, and then the grandchildren or children, children, they have only 2.1. They are absolutely obedient to the capitalistic masters. <coughs> and that's a free country. <coughs> so that, uh, um, that brings us to, to uh, Ratzinger. Now, uh, Ratzinger grew up in Germany. He wasn't the Hitler youth, like I wasn't the Hitler youth. The Hitler youth was a state youth, and everybody had to go there. Uh, later on, he said he didn't, um, he didn't go. That's not possible. Uh, you had to go, otherwise you were punished. So I have that in my family. My father died early from cancer, and I was taking care of my brother. And so one day on Wednesday, there was a Hitler youth, usually on a Saturday. I told him on Wednesday, I said, you know, let's, let's learn Latin and Greek, and then you will become something. And uh, um, if you go to them, they would not last very long. So my brother, two years younger, he was very angry. And he went to the Hitler youth and said, uh, you know, my brother said you will not last very long. I should do Latin. And so, so then they took the, the, the uh, what is it, the governor of the state of Hessen took my money away for, for the school, for the elite school. And uh, so my mother, it would be her whole salary to pay for that so she couldn't pay anymore. And, but uh, the fascism, very contradictory things happen. So there was a power through joy trip on the Rhine River. And uh, my mother went to the director of her shoe factory who had taken over that had been stolen from the Jews and the state took over. And she told this director and he said, we will pay it. So the governor took it away, the shoe factory gave it. That's how I could go to that elite school. Otherwise I would have ended up there and so on. So, when that Jewish woman came on top of it, the SS men uh, asked my director there that I would be, have to be punished for what I did, that I helped this Jewish pig to carry her suitcase. That was a crime, and so I was to be punished. And I was never punished for this, but if that had to come together, then I would have lost the whole money again. So that, that was the life under, under fascism there. So then also, uh, Ratzinger said, Joseph said that uh, he was in the army and he deserted. I was also in the army. I was a lieutenant in the German army. And uh, I never deserted because if you desert uh, in any army, the question is, you know, do you have a right? You took an oath according to the New Testament. You shouldn't take an oath. That would have been the right thing. But you took, took an oath, so I did, took an oath. So, um, and then if you take one, I mean, then you have to take it seriously. Or you should say from the very beginning, you don't take it, then they would have shot you. But if you take it, you have to uh, have a reason. And one reason would be that your government has become illegitimate. That means that your government has committed such horrendous crimes. We have this discussion about the drones now. See, that's an international crime, it's murder. Uh, and it happens, 250 people a month are killed by that time. Uh, so uh, the, the question is then if the people know what their government is doing. Now, uh, the, I knew about the concentration camps, but um, I didn't know that people were killed in the concentration camp. It, these were working camps, that means camps for cheap labor. Capitalism needs cheap labor. We take our instruments to the colonies of Central and South America, the Philippines, the Germans had another method. They brought the labor into the country. Even with Yugoslavia, they still do, did it. And that brought the Yugoslav conflict. So um, because the Germans suddenly said, let's do it the American way, because we save all the social costs. Now we have these 12 million cheap labor coming in. And suddenly we have the high social costs, and therefore the controversy. The owners want to have that cheap labor, but the citizens don't want to pay the taxes in order to for the social, uh, social costs in terms of health care and uh, education and so on. That is our conflict at the, at the moment. But you do need cheap labor in the concentration camps where all is connected with a corporation, an American corporation, a British corporation, a German corporation, with cheap labor. And uh, so uh, the, um, and then they had you know, other people they brought in, they needed a lot of cheap labor. So that's what people knew. 
and the common people, little people like my mother, they thought the lazy people are put into concentration camp. Who is lazy? The gypsies are never working. And the Jews, whom they have never allowed to work, but they pushed them into circulation. That means they could only sell, which was looked down upon because the salesman does not add any value and still has an income. They didn't grasp this. So therefore, the Jews were pushed into this. <coughs> <coughs> and they were got involved into capitalism, and then they were blamed because they didn't work, or they were lazy, or so. And then the communists, they challenged the right of the owner to take the surplus value from their workers. So the workers get a salary, which is only a small part of what they produce, and the rest is surplus value. That's what the whole capitalistic system rests on. And so they were lazy. So then the homosexuals were also lazy somehow, and they were all put into the concentration camps. So. <laughs> that's what um, uh, that's what we that's what we knew about this whole thing. So, so the question is, that didn't look like a crime yet to most Germans, to put people in those camps in order because they were so lazy. Um, so therefore, what crimes had been committed? So, when I was drafted to the Air Force, I did not go. <coughs> because in the Catholic Youth Movement, they had said, you know, the war goals of Germany to colonize Russia and so on is not ethical. Um, and so I didn't want to go, but the officer came next day and said I had no choice. And so I went and I was trained in, in, at the airport then to defend the cities. And when I saw Frankfurt burning, like you saw it in this picture there, then I uh, decided uh, not, I, I was forced, but I did it also voluntarily because I thought it was a good thing to rescue all these. When you see these ruins, you know, the war, there were people under these ruins there, under thousands <coughs> of them, you know, women and children and so on. So um, uh, that, that's how I um, got involved in this. But that also took, uh, took uh, you know, that didn't look like a crime. What, what the crime was were the, were the criminal war goals. The criminal war goals were revenge against the West and thievery against the East. Most wars are thievery, wars of thievery, and, but that was also a war for revenge. So that was unethical or so. But does it amount to delegitimating a government? A government is uh, legitimated by the recognition it receives from other country. The Hitler government was recognized by all the states around the world. That means the, even when you make war against the state, by making war against the state, you express your recognition uh, of the other side mutually. So the Geneva Convention rests on this mutual recognition. And there was no moment in my career as a soldier where I uh, could say my government has become so criminal that I am free from this uh, oath. But Ratzinger obviously knew better. He had some deeper insights, which I do not know. By the way, I know him, and I, I met him, and I am friends more with his opponents than with him. That means with Hans Küng, whom I brought here, and also with Metz, whom I brought here. These are the two uh, critics which he has around the world, and there are more than many more. Okay, so that, as far as the background is concerned, he had a very traumatic experience in Tübingen where he taught uh, theology. He was a specialist, he is a specialist for patristic, that means for the church fathers, for the Greek church fathers like Origenes, the founder of the Orthodox paradigm, and Augustine, the founder of the Roman Catholic paradigm, and all the other church father. So that is where he lives in. And that's what he wanted to spend his life uh, in. So that was his great dream. Now in Tübingen, the student movement, which I mentioned before, <laughs> broke loose. And the students were very nasty. They shouted and screamed, you know, to hell with Christ and so on. And he was deeply wounded by this, Joseph Ratzinger, and he fled to Innsbruck a small Jesuit university in uh, Austria, and uh, he taught there. So he went out of the world, practically, to hide from the world as it was going on. And all what he wanted was to sit in a nice room and write his books. And uh, uh, he has written uh, two volumes on Christology and, and other things. So 
<coughs> that's what he wanted. And then, somehow, and that was, of course, he, he agreed to it. They called him to Munich, and he became the Archbishop of Munich. And then he became, was called to Rome, and he became the Cardinal in Rome. And as a Cardinal, he also became the head of the Congregation for the Preservation of Faith, something like that, which is the former Inquisition. So that means he became the Inquisitor. And as the Inquisitor, he intervened in, uh, uh, in, uh, South, in Latin America. That is where he went into opposition to the liberation theologians. He asked them to come to Rome, into the Inquisition, and uh, hearings and investigation, they were not allowed. It's a very old, old-fashioned uh, Roman system, far away from modernity. You are not even allowed to bring a defender with you, a lawyer who could defend you. Some of these liberation theologians came to Rome with three cardinals, and the cardinals were not allowed to come in when Ratzinger did the investigation and so on. Um, a lot of them left the priesthood of the liberation theologians that, and then cared for the, uh, for the poor outside of their calling. And then uh, some of them left the church. Um, the critique was very sharp. Um, Ratzinger was afraid that their critique of the external class system would take over also the church's own class system, which we mentioned before. And uh, so he uh, cooperated in, in Nicaragua. The cardinal was already in, in, uh, cooperated with the uh, CIA all the time. And so he got involved in this opposition and tried to crash, the, uh, tried to repress the uh, liberation theology and was to some extent was effective. So uh, he met with Metz. Uh, uh, Ratzinger takes vacations in a little village in Bavaria, and he also was uh, met with Hans Küng. They are all Purdue in German, so they do not say C to each other. We all do, but we call each other on the first name, which is very intimate uh, friend friendship. Uh, Hans Küng came here, and we drank brotherhood with each other, so here in Kalamazoo. <laughs> so, and so it is still today, and so Hans Küng also uh, uh, was sentenced by Ratzinger. He, um, in the Christmas 1978, he was taken away from him the right to teach as a Roman Catholic theologian. I have the right, I'm doing that here now. So you need uh, some kind of a special permit or whatever, um, license or whatever to, uh, to do that. So they took that away from him so that he could not speak in the name of the church anymore. And at the same time, was unbelievably productive. He spoke in the UN and got 140 nations on his side for uh, um, what is it called? Uh, epos, um, etos, uh, global ethos. Yeah, global ethos. He developed, and all these nations agreed with it. So, but he could not do any of this in the name of the Roman Catholic Church, in spite of the fact that he himself always calls himself a. Roman Catholic uh, theologian. So I visited him uh, very often, and I came once, and he was laying on the couch, and he thought he had a heart attack <laughs> because Rome had put things in the newspaper against him without informing him first, and so on. So they cannot put people on the stake any longer, but they can go on your nerves uh, and make life uh, quite difficult, if you are a clergyman particularly. So, um, and so he has suffered a lot from them. But, he visit, uh, visited uh, the, uh, Benedict too in Rome then, but he could see him only in Castel Gandolfo because according to the canon law, um, the Pope is not allowed to see a heretic or somebody who is under the suspicion of a heretic. And uh, Hans Küng has criticized the infallibility dogma uh, of the Pope, um, that means of 1870. So, um, the infallibility dogma has also been criticized by a Swiss historian because the Pope, um, the cardinal who arranged the thing in 1870, he was the illegitimate son of the Pope at that time. And the Pope was also not healthy in his mind. And in 1870, the Prussian-French war started, and therefore all the German uh, bishops left Rome the uh, French bishops also left Rome, 
and the American bishops left Rome and nobody knows exactly why they left. So the only bishops who were there were in agreement to, of the dogma, of the infallibility dogma. And uh, so that's how it came through. But that looks very uh, peculiar. And so uh, King has challenged that. But the teaching of the church is that if a council, and it doesn't, the numbers do not matter who is there, then it does that in the name of the Holy Spirit. And you cannot go back behind any dogmatization which the council has done any longer. You can only go forward. So you can express it better, but you cannot undo it. And so Hans Küng wanted to whatever. Maybe he wanted to express it better, but maybe he wanted also to undo it. And so that is one thing. But there are changes in Mariology, in Christology, in the teaching on grace, and so on. So there are, and because there is a suspicion of heresy, therefore Ratzinger did speak with him, but not in the Vatican. He's not allowed to speak in the Vatican, but he could only sit in a swimming pool and talk with him in the swimming pool in Castel Gandolfo, which has been changed in the meantime into a diplomatic uh, uh, center, um, which uh, is very peculiar and may have something to do with the new pope. It is possible that the new pope will be a diplomat and not an academic anymore. So there has been some kind of a shift toward diplomacy, which uh, theologically may be very, very questionable. So nevertheless, that is about the past and um, the uh, event you know, in Tübingen, uh, and uh, uh, therefore he turned, of course, against this youth movement. But uh, he also made practically in the last seven years an outright war against modernity. So there were the pious popes of the 19th century and one wrote the syllabus against the um, modernity in which he condemned everything, liberalism, socialism, birth control, everything. And somehow, uh, in spite of the fact that he called himself Benedict, he looked very much like these pious popes. And so from the very beginning, uh, there was an opposition growing up. And today, the newspaper asked me, you know, if that is true, if he is old and is uh, fragile and, and uh, he's one year old, a few months older than I am and of course we are getting old and fragile but all the popes of the last 600 years got old and fragile but they did not resign so therefore there must be something else why he resigned and there is no council which could challenge him as such but the opposition in the church has grown and I described that today and I think did he say something wrong when he says he is old and fragile? No, no, that's true. But what makes life so hard or harder as he is now old and fragile? That is that an unbelievable opposition grew up around him, which may have very well become unbearable. Um, and Hans Küng, uh, there is the leader Hans Küng is on, on television continually. But friends of mine in Germany, 144 of them, theologians, all theologians, uh, wrote a document and when the Pope came to, uh, to, uh, to Germany uh, half a year ago, I think it was October or so, <laughs> they submitted this to the Pope. And what were the issues? There were grievances. Um, and uh, the grievances were the following one. You know that when people are divorced and then they can go to communion, of course, but when they are married again, they cannot go to communion. And that is a hardship. So the theologians thought if these people marry a second time and the marriage goes well and they take care of themselves, of each other, and then they should also be able to go to communion. That was one of the grievances. Another one was about homosexuality and having a partner and um, that this should somehow be recognized when these two partners take good care of each other and uh, live a, a friendship life and so on. That was another thing. Another thing was women ordination, uh, which they wanted. Another thing was that the priesthood, that the priests who wanted to uh, live in celibacy, they can go on living in celibacy. But those who want to get married, um, 
should be able, should be free to get married. That means to cancel the forced celibacy as it is now, because if you leave, you know, you cannot leave in good standing, really. They, they explore your mothers and fathers if something was wrong with you from your youth on, that you are not living in celibacy anymore, and, and so on and so on. So it's a very nasty, nasty and dishonoring uh, type of a procedure. So they wanted to change that. And <coughs> in Frankfurt, I um, talked with the priest, I, I very often preach still in my old church in Frankfurt where I was uh, as a boy where I grew up. And so I'm, I'm in contact with the priest and I said, well, if we could uh, make it a free celibacy, huh? they said, nobody, nobody would stay in celibacy if you would make it free. And I said, well, then it is not voluntary uh, if that is the case. So an, an involuntary thing that is even condemned by St. Paul, who attacked once a group of people who forbid people to get married, not the clergy, but in general, and this is very much condemned. But the forced celibacy comes very close to that. So nevertheless, these 144 wanted that. I think that is about it, the women's ordination and uh, free celibacy for, um, for the priests if they wanted to and the homosexual issue, and I think that's it. And the Pope had a, a, a secret meeting with them, and uh, then uh, publicly in Rome condemned all of it. Not a thing of understanding or feeling or whatever what is behind that. I was sitting with Hans Küng once, we drank wine at the Rhine River, several years ago, and suddenly a messenger came, and the messenger said that the young priest had committed suicide. And Hans was sitting there and saying nothing. And after half an hour, he suddenly comes back to himself, and he said, it is a curse, it is a curse. Celibacy is a curse. And it is in, in many ways, and I don't want to go into the analysis now, but I had the same experience in the uh, town where I taught, and there also a young priest uh, hanged himself on the Christmas night in the tower because of a love affair he had, and he could not, they cannot settle this promise which they made uh, you know, to their uncle and their aunt and their grandmother, who spiritually castrated them already from the time they were altar boys forever, and then to, uh, with this new love affair, this new experience, and so on. The seminaries uh, have not enough uh, Eastern asceticism. Buddha, the Gautama, developed a science of asceticism, how you can deal with your will to life, with its libidinous aspects and its killer instinct on the other side, by depriving it of images, of aggression, libidinous images. But this is a long training, and in the East you have this training. They don't have it in the West. They simply say, you know, live in celibacy and there is no training how this is to be done. The monks of the Orthodoxy in Mount Athos, they have an elevator and nothing female can come up there. No cows, no milk, no eggs, nothing. So then you keep all the images away. But it takes more than these external things there in order to become a real ascetic person. It's problematic anyway because Jesus was not ascetic. He drank wine, he celebrated weddings, he ate with the friends, etc. So um, he was not a mystic, neither, Jesus. So, so, um, so therefore, if we say we follow Jesus, we don't have to, don't have to be ascetic, necessarily. It would be much better to love other people and let love dictate what we have to do and not to do instead of going through this training. But if they want people to live in celibacy, they have an obligation to train these people. If you let somebody take an oath when he's 25, he shouldn't take an oath in the first place, but if he takes an oath not to get married, that's what they do. It's not, it's not the virtue of chastity. It's not about chastity, which the secular priest takes. He only makes a promise not to get married. That's the difference between the two. So um, that, but even to make that promise with 25 years and uh, ignoring all the uh, possible encounters and maturation of body and soul and whatever, and the whole issue of uh, making nature human and humanity natural and so on, how the hell is supposed to all that to happen? So this, um, uh, that, uh, you know, the, 
to reject all that without any discussion was a great mistake. Now, at the same time, I want to say that he made a war on on the, on the on modernity, but it's not so consistent all the time. He went to Berlin and he made a discussion. Had a, he gave a speech before the German Diet, and he sided with the ecology thing. So he was almost very close to the Green Party, um, where he thinks we have to creation theology, we have to take care of our frogs and cats and fish and, and, and so on. So it was very advanced. That is possible too. Right?